Um, so we're going to change courses a little bit here, um, and we're going to switch to nerves. And we, everyone in this room knows nerve is the most important thing we do in all of plastic surgery. We all love our motor and sensory nerves, so we'll talk about nerves a little bit here. Um, so um, I want to get started uh, with Jay actually talking about uh, migraine headaches, optimizing outcome with migraine headache surgery. Jay. Great. 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 Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, it's really an honor to be a, a part of this. I never, ever, ever thought I would ever be on a panel with uh, nerve experts. Um, but, but about 10 years ago, I um, spent some tom time with uh, Bauman Guyron, and um, he turned me on to what's really become my favorite uh, thing to do. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about technique today. Um, I think one of the things that we as a group have realized is there's a lot of ways to do this surgery, and they all work, um, but I'd like to hit on a few points that um, may help us optimize our out outcomes and how we can continue to do that in the future. Uh, I'm a founder of a couple of startups. They're all in the aesthetic space, uh, nothing to do with this talk. So this is a common quote, and what, I, what I'm trying to say here is I think it's important to understand where you are in a field, and there's a lot of ways to look at that. What do we know and what do we not know? Um, one way to do that in plastic surgery is just do a PubMed search. And here's two common uh, fields uh, that we're all familiar with, breast reconstruction and fat crafting over a 30 year period. And you can look at the number of papers published. And at the end of 30 years, we're, we as a group are publishing about 350, 400 papers a year. Kind of gives you a sense of what our group does. In migraine surgery, there's been less than 70 papers, and most of those have Baum and Guyron's name on them. So we're really early in the field, and that's important to consider when you're talking about things like this. On the other hand, if you look at what the migraine uh, field in general is doing, it's over 1,000, almost 2,000 papers a year. A third of these patients are refractory to treatment, and so I think it begs the question, is it reasonable for us to think about alternatives, even surgery? And of course, this all came out of uh, various observations. Um, critical to all this is uh, Bauman, who um, noted, among others, that um, patients who were getting Botox uh, were reporting that their headaches were getting better. And this important study where he uh, retrospectively looked at his um, brow lift patients and found that a lot of them, after surgery, were reporting that their headaches were getting better. Um, and started to develop this concept of carpal tunnel syndrome of the head. Now, I'm not a nerve guy, but I, I kind of got this, right? Why would carpal tunnel happen only in the, in the hands and the feet? It should potentially happen anywhere, um, this sort of um, process. And um, Bauman and others, including Dr. Duchik here, I've got some of his illustrations on the top, Dr. Janice and others, did some really elegant anatomic work to help describe these um, triggers that we think um, can be a major cause of headache and migraine and can be released. Some critical uh, papers by Baum and his group, which many of you are familiar with, um, help to prove uh, out these uh, concepts. And at this point, as I said, there's less than 70 papers, but other groups, including ours, have shown that we can get a greater than 50% improvement in migraine headache index uh, between 60 and 95%. So how can we optimize these outcomes as we go forward? Um, as Bauman has taught us, and, and I think all of us have learned, selection is everything. You know, the dumbest thing you can do is take a, a disabled patient with chronic pain and operate on them and not make them better. This is a disaster. We need to truly study our outcomes as we do in every area of plastic surgery. Um, we think it's important to compare the, the, the best results with our worst, and um, particularly in a field like this that's very early, uh, it's, it's critical to share ideas. And without um, t lots of migraine symposia, and uh, I, I don't even think there's a textbook on migraine surgery yet, um, that involves um, getting together and, and talking um, frequently. So the art of selection uh, still is probably the most critical 
part of optimizing our results. Certainly, uh, we want to make sure we're operating on the right patients, so they have to have been seen by real migraine doctors, neurologists. Um, they have to have had uh, CAT scans. And, um, you know, you have to be sure of the diagnosis. Um, identification of specific triggers is key. Patients with migraines often have deep, undefined pain with an unclear starting point. These are not the patients you're gonna to wanna to operate on. The patients that we're talking about that have nerve compression or irritation or nerve involvement, nerve triggers, have specific pain points that start in a specific location. For the frontal trigger sites that involve this, um, the, um, uh, these uh, nerves uh, that you're familiar with, there's a classic story. The pain starts above the eyebrows, it's tender to touch, typically happens late in the afternoon. You can see the brow ptosis in deep uh, grooving lines. They often get ptosis with their symptoms and pressure and compression often uh, helps with their pain. They'll point to this and other common sites. And one of the things that our group has started doing, this actually was the idea of, uh, of uh, one of my uh, research fellows, is I have every patient before they see me draw their pain. They, they, they mark where it starts and where it goes. And, and I use all of the forms that Jeff and Bauman have developed over the years and I have patients uh, fill these out. Uh, but, I, but at this point, uh, the first thing I look at is this drawing. It really helps guide me in the discussion and, and sort these patients out early as to who might be a good patient and who might not for this type of uh, treatment. And uh, there are definitely some uh, more atypical diagrams that lead you to believe maybe something else is going on. The um, temporal trigger site, uh, again, very well described, uh, also has a typical story. Pain starts in the temple. They'll wake up with the pain. They tend to grind their teeth and have a, a long history of orthognathic surgery. And again, pressure and compression tends to help in these patients. And they will point right to that notch where we all know that nerve is most commonly found. And the pictures, as you expect, are pretty specific. We do see some more abnormal or atypical pictures, and this may indicate that these patients are not great candidates. The um, occipital trigger sites, um, again, the anatomy very well described, also has a typical story. Pain starts right where that nerve uh, comes out and meets the fascia. Um, can happen any time of day. These patients often have a history of trauma. I was just talking to Dr. Ducic, who says a, a tremendous uh, uh, part of his practice is post-traumatic um, injuries, and uh, I think we're seeing that as well. And these patients will tell you that they avoid the gym. They know if they go lift something heavy, they're gonna have a problem. And they'll point to a couple of spots that correspond to uh, well-known compression sites in the back of their head. Their drawings are usually very indicative of what's going on. This I would consider pathognomonic of occipital uh, neuralgia. You see that drawing and you're almost certain you're gonna operate on that patient if you get the chance. Some abnormal uh, pictures. Rhinogenic uh, trigger site is uh, very, very common. A lot of these patients um, have uh, involvement in the nose, and they always describe pain behind the eye. They'll wake up with the pain. In women, it tends to be cyclical with uh, mucosal swelling, and um, there are some very interesting uh, CAT scan findings that are quite important that we'll talk about in a minute. And, th and these patients will always put an X or a dot right on their eye. That's, again, almost pathognomonic of what's going on. Uh, clinical evaluation and diagnostic testing are important. We are all now um, like, um, using the Doppler ultrasound in the office, so um, we will uh, Doppler these sites of uh, pain where the pain starts, and very often you will find a signal there, particularly in the temporal area or in the areas of uh, minor, we call them minor trigger sites, and this is becoming more important, particularly the patients who we've operated on aren't quite getting better enough, and you'll put a Doppler right where they have residual pain, and there's a, there's a signal there that can be treated. Um, here's a, just an example of one of those sites. That's right where her pain is all the time. 
And uh, we now know from anatomic studies that there's a lot of crossing points between these nerves and vessels. And um, the way to treat them is just directly incise over this area and ligate the offending intersection. Um, CAT scans are important. I've learned that I have to look at these myself. Uh, very often the radiologists are not describing what we're interested in, and that includes things like conchobulosa, very often not, not uh, reported in the, um, in the uh, reports. Um, certainly, obviously, deviated septums are, and it's important to see where those um, points of contact are, and things such as paradoxical turbinates seem to be important, and yet uh, the radiologists never comment on them. Uh, we are also uh, seeing other things such as variations in anatomy in the uh, supraorbital nerve um, tunnels uh, here versus uh, notches on the uh, right side. Botox and nerve blocks are important and still um, somewhat controversial. Bauman has written um, papers saying that although this is a, a indication of who may do well with surgery. He doesn't think you need it um, and certainly has shown that uh, if he sees a patient, he, he can figure out who needs surgery. But I am finding that nerve blocks in particular are critical to my success in determining which triggers are important. Um, and if somebody doesn't get a great nerve block uh, response, I am uh, very wary of operating on them. Um, so this really is the screening that we do. We need a history. We've got to get a great exam. The story has to make sense. I uh, think nerve blocks are critical for me, and the Do Doppler ultrasound is um, becoming more useful. Those drawings that I showed you earlier, I don't stop with the screening. After I operate on these patients, I actually, um, in addition to my operative report, I do an operative report drawing on every patient, and I'm finding that that is uh, interesting and useful, and it's uh, ongoing work. This patient had pain um, worse on the left front than the right, um, and also had some particular uh, sites in the back of interest. And I describe here um, all the findings. Um, and here, uh, this patient uh, had a, a, a very high bony tunnel on the left, corresponding to the pain, maybe. We're uh, certainly looking at that. Here's another. Um, typical uh, pre-op drawing where uh, pain is worse on the right than the left, uh, occipital neuralgia patient. And again, a description of what I found, which was really a thicker involvement uh, of the fascia and a, a significantly intertwined um, occipital artery around the nerve right at the area of pain, but only on the right, not on the left. Um, here's a, another frontal patient where I didn't see a particular difference, but saw a strange anatomy on both sides. The trochlear and orbital nerves actually came through a common tunnel, which uh, is quite unusual. So we should certainly learn lessons from our failures. I really believe that when I go back on the patients who don't do as well as I thought they should, more often than not, I went on a story of a nerve block, I didn't do my own nerve block, or in retrospect, they'll say, well, I told you I did really well, but, but you know, uh, the block only made me a, a little better. And I think that we're learning that nerve blocks here are, um, should be used diagnostically as they are in other parts of the body. A nerve block on a patient who only has um, a two out of 10 is not very useful. If a patient has pain of five, six, seven, eight, nine or 10, that response actually can be uh, quite uh, helpful and I find it's very useful in sorting between some of these triggers. With the Doppler, you gotta cut right where the Doppler is. Early on, I would just go after the root of the temporal vessels and those patients never got better. The lesser occipital, I think anatomically, is more uh, variable than I thought, and I'm seeing patients from my own practice and from others who should have gotten better with a lesser occipital nerve decompression and didn't. They still respond to nerve blocks, and when I operate on them again, I'm finding a deeper branch where I didn't think it would be. Um, patients who have systemic nerve damage, a brachial plexus injury, um, lower extremity injury from an old trauma with um, uh, chronic pain, those patients tend to not get better. And it's, I, I don't understand exactly why that is. Perhaps these guys do. Um, and so that's a, a bit of the art. Uh, certainly there's a lot of room for more science. 
And so we are uh, certainly looking at our prospective outcomes and we're using not just the traditional um, tools for migraine, but also um, combining that with some that are well described in chronic pain patients. These, these are disabled patients that we are taking care of. And uh, traditionally, the migraine uh, headache index is the gold standard for this. And we consider patients who do um, better than 50% improved versus less than 50% failures. And just looking at our recent prospective outcomes, we are getting a 71% total decrease in the migraine headache index, and over 80% of the patients are considered a success by that traditional measure. But if you really look at it, what we found, and um, one of my fellows will present later this week, is that it's actually fairly binary in our hands. If you look at patients who get better than 80% better versus less than 15% better, that makes up most of the patients. It's about 86% of the cases. So they really either get better or they don't. And if you then go back and compare these best and worst patients, you see some interesting things. And we don't really know what this means yet, but this, the, these kind of studies we think could help us um, improve our outcomes uh, and selection going forward. Patients who tend to have a longer duration of pain preoperatively, so if they get a migraine that lasts a couple days, they're less likely to do well. Um, patients who, for some reason, have nausea or lightheadedness with their symptoms tend to do better. Um, patients that um, their migraines are brought on by fatigue, noise, or smell also do a lot better versus those that don't, don't get better. Interesting and uh, perhaps will help us understand the mechanism of this in the future. We've been looking at pain self-efficacy. This is something that has been used commonly with um, other uh, pain syndromes. And what this is is patients' ability um, to cope and do things, uh, everyday activities of everyday living. And if somebody has a low score, they have very, very poor um, pain self-efficacy, and they tend to have poor outcomes in other areas. And so we looked at this, and interestingly, our pain self-efficacy scores on the patients we're operating on are the lowest we can find in the literature. This is an extraordinarily low score. These patients are very, very disabled compared to chronic back pain or carpal tunnel or other hand injuries. And when you operate on these other patients, they get better. They get better. 13% for, for back pain, 8% uh, carpal tunnel. Our migraine patients got 122% better which is uh, really sort of intriguing and helps us place these patients in the context of, dis of disability. And um, certainly, I, I think will help us in explaining this to um, neurologists, uh, insurance companies, and, uh, and each other. Um, we're certainly uh, saving tissue. I'm hoping some smarter scientists than me, Paul, can tell us what to do with this, um, this tissue, because I think it's... Um, it's, uh, it'll be quite interesting to see the differences between uh, some of the tissues from areas where patients don't have pain versus where they do, patients who get better versus those who don't. Um, we do have a migraine surgery council. This was very much uh, promoted and pushed by Jeff Janis. And it's really been uh, very, very helpful. Um, this group is, is of the founders and we're growing and we talk once a month, we're talking about billing, coding, problems, um, uh, you know, what works, what doesn't. And I think this is the kind of thing that really helps move these early um, areas along and forward. And one of the really uh, great things that's come out of this is we now have a multi-center uh, study, which we uh, hope to uh, um, share with everybody in the near uh, future. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks, Jay. That's great. Um, so we're going to uh, change direction a little bit and talk about some uh, nerve gap reconstruction now. So um, I would like to say that uh, sadly I have nothing to disclose except I am a Michigan Wolverine fan. Uh, other than that, nothing else. Um, so I really want to um, frame this discussion around two different clinical cases and discuss how we might think of them differently in regards to nerve gap reconstruction. So I'm going to start with this particular case. It's a 37-year-old patient, had a laceration at the base of their non-dominant left thumb, 
six weeks prior to them seeing you. They have pain, like a painful neuroma there, absent temperature and pain sensation, and two-point discrimination is absent on the ulnar digital nerve. They have no other injuries. And so in the operating room, we see this, and we see a neuroma with a two-centimeter nerve gap, ulnar digital side of thumb. So when we think of reconstructing this, I think there are a lot of different things we have to think about. We have to think of acute, subacute, chronic, um, and where it's falling into that situation, the size of the gap, and whether this nerve is a critical or a non-critical nerve, like the ulnar digital nerve of the thumb, radial digital nerve of the index finger, or ulnar digital side of the small finger. So how would you reconstruct it? So just by a show of hands in the room, how many people would use a collagen nerve guide to reconstruct this two centimeter gap? Okay, no one. How many people would use a acellular nerve allograft? Okay, and then what about an autograft? Yeah, a lot more, yep, okay. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, so how efficient is the process of end organ re after nerve injury and repair? So if we go to the rat model and we look at a rat sciatic nerve, we cut that nerve and immediately repair it, or we cut that nerve and we repair it with a small number of axons proximally, sort of like a traumatic nerve injury. If we look at this, we can see that the force generated in a normal muscle is about 4,000 millinewtons. In a cut and repair muscle, it's basically the same. And then when we reduce the number of axons, it's down as expected. If we then look at motor units, single motor units going to that muscle to understand how those motor units remodel in response to that nerve injury, we can actually see that our motor units decline as we have fewer axons. So even when you immediately cut and repair a nerve, you have a decline from about 44 motor units in that muscle down to about 30. But keep in mind there's no force deficit. So what actually happens? What happens is those motor units compensate for the reduced number by increasing their innervation ratio. So each motor cell body innervates more muscle fibers and prevents you from losing that force. So we do know that the body can compensate some, but as we reduce the number of axons, they don't compensate enough and it goes down. And that's what we get when we have bad nerve injuries or damaged axons that don't actually have an opportunity to get to the end. So what if we're asking nerves to regenerate outside of endoneural sheath? So we're not just cutting and repairing, but we're actually asking them to reinnervate a muscle like through an empty conduit. So if we just use a muscle neurotization model, and here we just cut the sciatic nerve here, and we just implant the nerve into the muscle. What needs to happen? Well, it needs synaptogenesis. So those axons need to find their way back to muscle fibers. And when they do, then they have to create new neuromuscular junctions and reinnervate that muscle. And we do that, we know that we have about a 50% uh, force deficit. So those muscles just don't recover as well. So we know when nerves regenerate outside of endoneural conduits, they don't regenerate as well. It's just not as efficient. And so when we're asking nerves to reinnervate muscles, if we're asking them to do it, in an empty conduit, we're asking them to accomplish something that's very difficult for them, even under the optimal of circumstances. So let's look at nerve gap reconstruction with different approaches. So if we go back to our same RAT model, we do a sham group, a cut and repair group, and nerve gap reconstruction. If we look, here's our sham group, 4,000 millinewtons, our cut and repair group, 3,700, and even with a two centimeter autographed, we actually have a pretty substantial um, force deficit. So what does that tell us? That tells us that even the best approach that we have, we still have substantial force deficits. And then if we increase the size of that gap and we compare it with acellular graphs, we would have a two centimeter autograph, four centimeter autographed, acellular graphs that are two centimeters and four centimeters long, we actually see our two and four centimeter autographs perform about the same, but our acellular graft has a decline in force, and our four centimeter um, A cell, that's um, labeled incorrectly, our four centimeter has an even greater reduction in force generating capability. So what does that tell us? That tells us the longer the gap, the more difficult the regeneration, the longer the gap, the more likely 
you are to require some biologic support of some variety. So we know axons regenerate better within an endonerial environment. We know synaptogenesis is way more efficient if axons are guided there through endonerial conduits. And we know primary repair is better than nerve graft repair. And nerve graft repair with autograft, with biologic support, outperforms any of the acellular approaches as gaps get larger. So let's go back to this case. So um, I think for a small two centimeter gap, you can probably use just about anything. I know I just told you about rat model and things. I think you could use a conduit, a biologic or synthetic conduit. You can use an allograft. You can use an autograft. Um, what did I do? If it was my thumb, I want an autograft because on that side of my thumb, that's what I want. I think it's going to give the best outcome. So I used an autograph to repair this critical nerve. I used a sural nerve donor, only a portion of the sural nerve to match the size of that. And I just think it's a little bit better than using a PIN or something like that. So let's look at a different case now. Let's look at a wrist laceration. So this is a 50-year-old farmer lacerated his wrist while he was in Mexico. He flew home, had it repaired by a hand surgeon. Median nerve was completely lacerated. That was repaired, and a bunch of tendons were repaired. Four and a half weeks of immobilization, extensive rehab for four months, and had no return of motion and minimal return in sensation. So at four months, patient has minimal motion in their fingers and no sensory recovery in the median nerve. And when we look at this patient, we basically see a four centimeter gap in their median nerve at their wrist. So for this four centimeter gap in the median nerve at the wrist, how many people would use a collagen nerve guide to repair that? Nobody. nobody. How many people would use a decellularized nerve allograft, human allograft? Nobody. So everyone in the room is going to use an autograft then, I guess. So this is, this is different in this case. This is a totally different situation because here it's a four centimeter gap versus a two centimeter gap. So that's much harder. It's a mixed nerve. It's a mixed motor and sensory nerve, which makes it far more complicated than pure sensory nerves. It's a big diameter nerve with a lot of fascicles as compared to a small digital nerve, which makes it harder. And it's a four month delay. So let's talk about each of these things, okay? So let's talk about four centimeter versus two centimeter. We talked about that before, but there is a perceived ability of the various constructs that are out there to effectively reconstruct gaps that are of four centimeter, even six centimeter lengths. But I think the thing that's important is you really have to look at the experimental model that's used to evaluate it and what outcomes are measured. So in the clinical studies that are reported in the literature, a lot of them, there's a lot of patient selection bias. The robustness of the outcome measures that they're looking at are not necessarily that strong. And there's lots of confounding variables, which makes it very confusing when you're reading some of the studies out there with some of the various nerve constructs. Experimental studies also can be confusing. We talk about these rat models all the time, but rats actually regenerate their nerves very quickly, and they have really robust axonal sprouting and regeneration. So even when I show you good outcomes in rats, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be equally as good in humans. They're certainly not going to be worse in rats than human. Or, yeah, they're not going to be worse in rats than they would be in humans. And in some of these models, the muscles get really rapidly re so that makes things a bit confusing as well. But what we do know is even if you're using a very good model, you have to evaluate what the outcomes are measured to. So for instance, a lot of outcomes in the experimental models will just look at histomorphometry. But just a bunch of axons after nerve repair isn't important because you don't know what those axons are doing. You don't know if any of them got to their end organ. And you don't know if any of them are contributing to functional recovery. So you really need to be looking at these studies and understanding the robustness of the outcome measures and making sure end organ function is being evaluated, not just numbers of axons. So, and when we think of the clinical studies, too many confounding variables many times. Outcome measures not particularly robust. Mechanisms of injury are highly variable. Short follow-up, underpowered studies. So those are all very confusing and difficult as well. So what about mixed motor and sensory nerves versus a pure sensory nerve? What we know for sure is that different types of nerve grafts perform better for different types of nerve injuries. So sensory nerve grafts work better for sensory nerves. 
motor nerve grafts work better to repair motor grafts, or motor nerve injuries. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I take somebody's femoral nerve out to repair um, a motor nerve deficit in the upper extremity? Uh, probably not, but if there are some opportunities to use motor nerve to repair motor nerve, your outcomes are better for sure. We also know that sensory axons regenerate far better than motor axons. They're small, they're lightly myelinated. It doesn't take a lot of metabolic load for them to, to sprout and elongate. So sensory nerves do far better than motor nerves. So a study that tells you that somebody is using some type of conduit to repair a four centimeter digital nerve is very different than a four centimeter median nerve defect. Something that works okay for sensory nerves won't necessarily work okay for motor nerves. Bigger nerves with more fascicles are different than smaller nerves as well. So studies on tiny little digital nerves don't ne necessarily extrapolate into larger nerves. So what do we know about it? There are significant blood supply issues that are different in smaller nerves than in larger nerves. You can overcome some of this with cable grafts in a multifascicular nerve to allow there to be better blood supply to the nerve grafts you supply, but certainly there are vascular issues as well. In the past, vascularized nerve grafts have been used to reconstruct some of these larger nerve gaps to provide better blood supply and help the regeneration. But in general, I think a majority of those studies hasn't shown enough benefit to make vascularized nerve grafts something that are commonly performed now. And you certainly can't use large nerve conduits for any of these larger nerves simply because of the poor vascularity and the axons will just die. So let's talk a little bit about the difference in case one and case two. The first case, six week delay. The second case, a four month delay. With that delay, outcomes are worse as well because of chronic exotomy. We know that after about two months of denervation, this entire process of chronic exotomy in the distal nerve progressively gets worse. As it progressively gets worse, it becomes more difficult for it to support axonal regeneration. And we know a lot of things happen when axons lose contact for a long time with Schwann cells. The Schwann cells don't express their associated genes. They don't express the receptors for those genes or for the growth factors. They don't express the same growth factors. They undergo atrophy. They don't sustain their ba uh, bands of Bunger and they fragment and essentially disappear. So the Schwann cells do not survive this long-term exotomy well. So the longer a Schwann cell is living without an axon, the worse it supports regeneration. So it is even more important as we get further out from an injury to have Schwann cells that are viable to support axonal regeneration. And even with chronic exotomy of the distal Schwann cells, if we start putting in non-biologic construct to reconstruct these gaps, it won't support regeneration like it needs to. So for this four centimeter nerve gap in the median nerve at the wrist, I think there's three options you could use, a nerve autograft or a nerve autograft or a nerve autograft. Um, and um, if it was even earlier and you saw this acutely, I think still, probably nerve autograft. Although there are a number of studies that people will report out there supporting use of some of the other constructs for this gap. So what do we know? Short gaps, two to three centimeters in tiny little nerves, you can probably use just about anything. Longer gaps, I really believe you need neurotrophic support. You need cellular elements to support that regeneration. Sensory nerves are definitely different than motor nerves. Large nerves are very different than small nerves. And be really careful when reviewing the clinical studies because the outcome measures may not necessarily be optimal. The outcome measures may not tell you exactly what you need to know to help guide your appropriate clinical treatment. And lastly, delayed nerve repairs are very different than acute nerve repairs. And as it gets further out from an injury, you really have to start thinking about biologic support for those uh, sprouting and elongating axons. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Ivan. Hello, everybody. After I realized yesterday on the plane, 
what the real title of my talk is. It made me wake up tonight at 2 a.m. to prepare this talk. So, Paul, if I switch from, Croatian, from English to Croatian in the middle of my talk, it's your fault. So, nerve surgery for pain. How much pain does it give to the surgeon? So let's review that a little bit. In terms of disclosures, uh, my practice is 100% related to nerve surgery, and um, I'm also the medical director for the Oxygen as of January. If I try to quiz the room, how many of you think that um, nerve surgery does have issues and can cause problems. Certainly, each one of you might have different answers depending on what phase of your life and career I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to come back to this slide to explain what I just exactly said. But let's review a couple of the facts out there that I learned in the past 15 years of my practice. And it's kind of inconvenient truth. Chronic pain syndrome can follow any surgery, can happen in any patient, regardless of age or sex, and can develop, obviously, following the surgery for, nerve, for the pain as well. Nerve reconstruction outcome can go from no recovery to full recovery in both motor and sensory, regardless what best or gold standard technique you are utilizing. And nerve decompression can range from complete success to complete failure and can even develop into CRPS. Anybody in this room, if it's doing nerve surgery on bigger scale, understand what I mean with this. But there are a few more facts. Chronic pain treatment in terms of who treats it out there, it's complete chaos. There is really no jurisdiction at what point one specialist is going to be referring to the other specialist or why. Communication between specialists is pretty much I can't hear you. And interdisciplinary care and referrals is suffering significantly from understanding proper timing and also consequences of late referrals for the certain, certain procedure. And what about surgeon? Some people I looked after in my life taught me, you know, surgeon is his worst enemy. I certainly believe that in the operating room would be the case. And Wendell Merritt taught me also, who is probably the biggest expert on complex regional pain syndrome, that uh, more he studied RSD and CRPS, less he understood it. So I kind of have to agree with that one as well. If you are looking into the challenges and complications of nerve surgery, I would pretty much break them down into several critical factors. Surgeon's expertise certainly matter, and timing and type of the intervention is very important. Anatomical variations, residents always used to make fun of me when I would tell them how difficult anatomy and challenging would be. They forgot that every Wednesday in my year of nerve fellowship in Baltimore, I actually spent in a state anatomy lab dissection Re looking at every nerve from every different angle and understanding how the nerve anatomy can actually be humbling. Post-traumatic and post-surgical history is critical to factor in when you want to treat somebody, especially for nerve injuries and chronic pain, and obviously you need to step back and reassess who is standing in front of you and what underlying medical problems are there. All of these in combination can certainly uh, intervene on both acute and delayed nerve complications if in any patient we are treating. In, regardless if you are doing decompression, neuroma management, or nerve reconstruction, generating suboptimal outcomes. So in terms of pain for the surgeon and kind of for the patient as well, let me re break it down into a couple of things. First, going over you know, um, meetings since 1998 forward, um, I learned that people look very smart on the stages. They speak pretty much only about successes and nobody has complications. And then there is a Black Monday where everybody comes back from the meeting and then disaster strikes. So uh, anybody that has some experience with that understands also what I'm saying with that. So in 2011, I realized that there was actually no classification of nerve complications at all. I put this table over here, breaking it down to major, intermediate, and minor, looking at my own consecutive procedures in whatever at that time number of years I was doing that. And that's something very important to look critically what and how you're doing and performing. So, in terms of nerve injuries and problems, they can't, not necessarily they can actually happen in complications during nerve excisions and reconstruction. They can happen also during the nerve, nerve decompressions with fairly straightforward compression neuropathies. This is a well-written and well-studied subject for decades. The problem out there is that medical community and surgical community are going two different directions and understanding, especially in diabetic neuropathy population, who should be operated, why yes and why no. Unfortunately, end result of this is that patient continues to suffer, complications pile up, and unfortunately, legal consequences as well. 
when I looked in this, as I said, 15 years of work, what the reasons most commonly are, unfortunately, all of us play, play a role in that. Medical community explains every single prestigious and nerve-related problem and assigning that to diabetic consequence. Pain medications become priority treatment choice. Surgeons might not understand what proper indication and proper timing of the surgery or type of the surgery to be involved. And everybody might think it's okay to wait, nerve is gonna come back on its own. This slide here is a perfect prescription for disasters in every single aspect of that. 2011, I published a study when not to operate with this kind of patients and population because looking into complications and failures from some reports that I was reviewing, pretty much I could summarize them in the left lower corner over here in terms of understanding clearly when this patient should not be operated because you will create failures and generate complications if you ignore that. Similar to lower extremities, we, have, we can apply the same principle in, in the upper extremity. Looking into the management of the neuroma, uh, we need to understand what the cause of the problem is. Uh, first is the injury related to the compression, traction stretch injury, or direct mechanical injury. Each one of these is going to mandate separate treatment choice. Historically, we do know how the nerve reconstruction were managed in terms of excision of the neuroma implantation to the muscle, and later on also reconstructions in terms of either partial or complete neuroma resection with number of different procedures we had. We've proven that approach with, with number of different parts of the body, the patient's abdominal wall pain, groin pain, breast pain, amputee pain, lower extremity pain, headache pain, etc. All of these business algorithms pretty much have one thing in common, and that is fix the pathology if it exists, and if it doesn't exist, treat the patient conservatively. If that doesn't work, to try to define what the cause of the problem is before you move on into the surgical arena. One other thing that all of these problems have in common, and that is that untreated nerve damage, unfortunately, is going to progress to CRPS in one or the other form, and that is unfortunately a problem. And if you're taking a close look into what the uh, breakdown in the medical specialties is uh, that are involved in early phases versus late phases, you will see how the surgical treatment in the beginning becomes rather powerful and more often to be applied if, initi if initiated on time, while later on becomes minor issue and, um, um, and the pain management procedures and psychological treatment becomes the uh, uh, priority. The, the, the role of understanding this and why is that the case is primarily to understand that any nerve damage can cause peripheral sensitization anywhere in the body, and that is actually the optimal time for intervention. If that is not being uh, addressed on time, that peripheral sensitization is going to uh, progress to central sensitization that ultimately is going to give you CRPS, and then hell is going to break loose because you're going to deal with 17 variables instead of two when treating these patients. The other important paradigm that's happened, I would say, in the past two decades is how we perceive to manage neuroma. Like in plastic surgery, we used to take a fat from here, we used to kind of debulk the stuff, etc. Now we are trying to fill the breast, we are trying to fill the orbit and other parts of the body to try to restore what was originally there. So I would say that past approaches in terms of of managing damaged nerve was just to remove the damaged nerve. The newer approach is over here to go ahead and try to restore the nerve function as best as you can, either with allograft, autograft, connector-assisted neurography, enthocyte neurography, TMR, or regenerative peripheral nerve muscle interface. I use actually all of these, and all of these have a role in patient's treatment. The problem becomes first when you don't understand the role of each one of these, and when you apply one modality to all of the problems in the same way. That's how you're going to unfortunately fail and generate the problem in patient. So we are talking already about nerve reconstruction. Paul touched a couple of the things, and just to um, uh, reiterate some of the points. Obviously, gold standards are listed here if gold standard exists pretty much, but newer techniques certainly have their role in their applications over here. I remember when I started residency, conduits were like holy water. We used it for everything, two, three, four centimeters, whatever stretch of that it could be, we could use it. Obviously, evidence-based data later on, on this easy-to-read slide over here, taught us that, uh, unfortunately, only short gaps are really effectively treated with this. And the problem starts about larger gaps, 
that uh, the effect of the conduits becomes really mediocre. I personally published a study with two and a half centimeter spinal accessory nerve treated with the, uh, with the, with the conduit. I wouldn't do it today for a million dollar you know, award for that. That's how much we evolved over time. So at certain point we do what we do, but we have to pay very close attention to whatever evidence-based data are. And this, this evidence-based slide goes pretty much about a couple of page, a couple of screens to actually bring you the breakdown into the new one. Nerve reconstruction uh, uh, for the damaged nerve. So if you have, let's say, superficial peroneal nerve damage and you have a deficit there and you would like to reconstruct that, I can't find a patient who's going to allow me to take the sural nerve to reconstruct the superficial peroneal nerve. So Although the concept is completely correct, unfortunately, sometimes in the management of pain, you really can't rob Peter to pay Peter because that makes no sense. Process nerve allograft certainly actually came very handy along the time and pretty much in my hands at least revolutionized how I now treat the chronic pain because I can reconstruct at no expense uh, to the patient. Easy slide to read one more time, talking about some evidence-based data and some details that actually Paul actually warned about how certain things need to be carefully to be interpreted. But the studies actually indicate that in human studies comparing to the red studies, you can actually have very respectful numbers in terms of regeneration, even using the allografts. So what about basic principles of nerve surgery? This is probably bizarre that I actually show this late. But in my humble opinion, next six, seven slides are probably about 75% reason why nerve surgery doesn't work. First, timing and severity of the injury from the injury to the time when the intervention is going to be taken care of are reversely proportional to that. There is a plethora of the evidence-based data that nobody can ignore in this day and age. So delayed nerve repair is bad. Paul talked about acute recovery and late recovery. All of us know it's very different to reconstruct the nerve uh, that is uh, two weeks old versus four months old, or to decompress the nerve where compression is present for seven weeks versus seven months. Outcomes in anybody's hands have to be different. In terms of neuroma excision, this is very bizarre phenomenon, I would call it, within plastic surgeons. We are brainwashed that we need to go ahead and debride the tissues, all of us. There is no, that's pretty much debridement is the key of any reconstruction. Yet, when we come to the nerve, there is a hesitation to do that because you know that with every slice, you're going to be enlarging the gap and you're going to be limiting choices how you can reconstruct it by every millimeter you do that. But unfortunately, if you're going to be reconstructing the nerve with the, about 60-70% uh, of the scar in there, better don't do that reconstruction. You can put a gold in between of that gap, it is not going to grow. So message here, together with evidence-based data, the inadequate resection of nerve damage is unfortunately perfect prescription for the failure there. Misalignment is the other problem. Uh, we all thought how nerve looks very nice and round and we can do it in a very good way. But unfortunately, if we haven't done proper job in terms of rearranging that nerve in terms of proper alignment, we're going to generate actually neuroma and continuity and that subsequently is going to cause problems and failure to restore all of the three functions. Anybody who is trying to repair two or three or plus millimeter nerve with three or four flimsy fascicles with some of them even half a millimeter thick, uh, you will understand that even bringing 9 or 10 on and trying to oppose it perfectly, you will see how handicapped surgeons actually you can appear to be. Connectors, in that case, at least revolutionize the way how I do it because they are transparent, and I with them minimize, eliminate uh, misalignment completely, leaving a very small crevice in between. So misalignment is bad for you, and in the interest of time, I'll just go fairly quickly to say that the tension is very bad for you. Anybody in this day and age who's going to cut the two centimeter nerve at elbow or anywhere, flex the extremity and through serial expansions with the splinting, is going to try to expand that nerve pretty much is significant deviations from the standard of care. So please don't do that because you have about abundance of data in terms of showing how the an, an entire Elizarov, Elizarov actually um, literature speaks as well that neuropraxia with the tension-induced uh, ischemia is the key uh, problem uh, over there. Ultimately, we have a number of different choices in this day and age we can utilize uh, for the nerve reconstruction and we should be um, individually tailoring for the patient's uh, needs. Two last concluding slides. 
I would say that nerve surgery needs to be highly individualized on every patient. There is no gold standard for everybody. Expertise matter, and it does not equal entitlement, regardless whose feelings might be hurt with this. Communications between providers is important, should be better. Technological ad advances that we've seen over the past 20 years should be used on evidence-based data rather than I like it or not. And timing and referral of intervention often dictates treatment choice and the outcome. So my answer in terms of um, does the uh, treatment for surgical pain cause pain? Well, when I was very um, young and had a little bit more hair on my head, I would probably say, no, you can treat everybody. There are no problems. But you do know that reality is somewhere over here. There can be some painful scenario that you have to deal with regardless of what you've done in your practice. And ultimately, us as a team in terms of specialties um, are going to do um, uh, better only if we work together. Thank you. for that talk. Um, uh, I will open this up uh, to any questions that people have. We are running a little bit late, so we'll take a couple of questions. Um, and I wonder first, um, Jay, could you just talk, um, when you do a migraine headache, and Yvonne also give us uh, your opinions, when you get you do a migraine headache, how often does somebody then draw a different diagram of where their pain is? They still have pain. The pain you treated is better, but now they have different pain. Yeah, it's a, it's a a great question and an interesting phenomenon that I think we've all seen is that if you take your um, excellent responders, so patients who do well, up to about 20% of them at some point will come back with a different pain diagram. Now, it could be, gee, you know, I'm 80, 90% better. You treated my occipital neuralgia, which I now understand that's, that's what it was, but now I'm getting pain in the front all the time. And, um, and, and often those patients can be helped. You go through the same process of, um, of diagnosis and exam. But Ivan? Uh, human brain pretty much is going mm -hmm. to respond to the highest level of the stimuli, and the patient is going to verbalize that primarily to you what bothers them the most. Mm -hmm. Once you take down the most troubling area, then they will tell you, well, before I didn't have this, now mm. I have that. Well, yeah. nobody, obviously, by doing occipital surgery, did anything to the frontal or side. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, those areas now resurface as now the highest offender before, like the occipital area has been mm -hmm. taken down. You routinely see this in a practice, and certainly patients need to be counseled about that so that they wouldn't be like you're chasing your own tail by doing something about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, been fascinating to me, too, because what I didn't understand when I got into this, which I do now, is that, you know, we're so obsessed with making patients better, right? But if you have this kind of pain, any pain sucks. <laughs> and so it's not uncommon that a, pa a real success will come back and my staff will come out, you know, they brought the patient in and say, oh, it's terrible, you know, she's, she's not doing well. And you'll go in, and the patient's one of your happiest patients. And she'll say, well, you know, I'm, I can now go to work. I can do this. I, can do that. I still have pain, but it's, but it's far less. And they and we really would, I mean, we want to eliminate all pain. Yes, please. Hi, Guy Stoffman, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Paul, great panel. Uh, one comment, two questions. Uh, your observation of vascular compression and nerve pain is somewhat fascinating. And 40 years ago, Peter Janetta who was a neurosurgeon at Pittsburgh, came up with a, an observation that the posterior cerebellar artery was compressing the trigeminal nerve. And then watching him do this operation that we were able to do, he would simply just put a sponge between that and the trigeminal nerve, and people that were suicidal were cured. Mm. Uh, then we go back and we look at the carpal tunnel analogy, and again, it makes all the sense. So you talk about Bauman, who tells you the story 10 years ago when he tried to present his data to the American Society of Neurology and they were going to kill him because essentially he was going to put neurologists out of work. And so, William, my question to you is, number one, how do you establish your relationship with your neurologists that they'll believe in you because essentially you're going to be taking patients away from them forever, number one. And then number two, you mentioned in your CAT scans that uh, when I was an otolaryngology resident a number of years ago, there was an entity of Sluter's neuralgia, which seemed to be a compression uh, septoplasty or the septum compressing the vidian nerves that came out of the pterygopalatine ganglia. 
and then we would do septoplasties and their frontal headaches would go away. Mm -hmm. So do you ever test that in your clinics? In other words, coconizing the nose and seeing number one if that works. And yeah. then to my peripheral nerve surgeons, should I be wrapping every primary repair, every autograft I do if I'm trying to direct axonal proliferation, should I be wrapping my repairs with conduits? Oh, Gene, yeah. Go ahead. Well, great, uh, great questions, things that we think about every day. I think that the um, relationship between us and the neurologists is uh, complicated. Um, the, the easy thing to say is we're taking away their, their patients. I think that's absolutely not true. Um, in fact, very few of the patients that I see have a neurologist anymore. The neurologists have fired them. I mean, I, I can do nothing more for you, or vice versa. I think it's more an issue of us saying, hey, what you've been taught in your training, what you really believe, um, you know, we think you're wrong. And that's what's really um, uh, so upsetting to them. I, I do think that we are... Um, uh, constantly uh, trying to interact with them, and it's it's getting better. You know, in Boston, some of the most outspoken neurologists um, are there, and have uh, the ones who've uh, argued with Bauman uh, in the journals are actually um, just across uh, town from us. And I can just tell you from my experience, I've been on the phone with them many times. I've had them in my operating room, and they are now sending me some of their worst patients, and slowly coming around, and, and w what we've done is we've started to agree to, to disagree or agree to agree. It's a matter of semantics. You know, I think you know, Bauman makes this point all the time, and we try to make the point all the time, is that we're not curing migraines. Migraine is a problem of the brain, that's fine. You guys are the brain doctors. What we're doing is we're deactivating triggers, which we think um, are, are leading to uh, migraines in those patients. And I think the neurologists are now coming around to that idea, saying, oh, okay, you're not, you're not curing migraines, you're, you're, you're treating these you know, compression type problems. And so I, it's getting better. Um, as far as this, the nose and the septum go, that's fascinating. You know, that's been known, uh, it's been known to be related to headaches and migraines for 60 plus years. I still think we don't understand what's going on, frankly. Um, you know, I see lots of patients who come in my office who clearly have rhinogenic headaches and they've already had their septum worked on. And um, I think that some of them have actually had either um, in, inadequate, it's, it's not the septum that was the problem, it's that nasopalatine nerve. And as the, as the septum goes over that vomerine groove, it's crushing that nerve, maybe irreparably, maybe it's a problem that you can't be fixed at that point because it's gone on so long. But I think it's far more complicated than we yet know. Uh, I certainly have tried to treat patients with, uh, you know, Afrin or lidocaine in the office, and it, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Thank you. All right. Um, so I think we're uh, far enough behind that we'll stop the discussion here. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gordillo and uh, Dennis Orgel and Nick Vetter to come on up. Thanks, everyone.